Welcome back to our study in the Book of Acts. I took a slight digression last time talking about the timeline of Genesis to Revelation, how things fit together to we see that the, the death, burial, resurrection is a key element that God uh, demonstrated to, in order to enable us to come back to himself. I'm going to discuss for the next three lessons uh, the way of salvation and how that appears in the scriptures and help us to have a better understanding, a deeper understanding of how we need to respond to the gospel that God has declared. Our spiritual condition needs to be seen. If we don't realize that we've got a problem, we're not going to look for the cure. The Bible describes us, because of our sin, as being lost, separated from God, unable to save ourselves. Ours is a hopeless condition indeed, yet God wants us to be saved. The dilemma that faced God was this. How can he forgive our sins and also carry out the justice that his law demands for violators? God cannot ignore the fact that we have broken his holy law and that carries a severe penalty. In Christ Jesus, the Father found one whose death would fully satisfy the demands of justice, thereby enabling him to forgive our sins. Why did Jesus come? The need for the death of Jesus, from the announcement of his conception, the mission of Jesus was linked to our spiritual recovery. The angel told Joseph that the child Mary was carrying was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The child was to be named Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. This redemptive theme was echoed throughout the ministry of the Lord Jesus the Christ. He said that he had come to seek and to save what was lost and to give his life as a ransom for many. Romans chapter, 20, chapter 3, verse 23 and onward says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Yes, all have sinned, all have fallen short of God's glorious ideal, and now God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his kindness, freely takes away our sins. But God sent Jesus Christ to take the punishment for our sins and to end all God's anger against us. He used Christ's blood and our faith as a means of saving us from his wrath. In this way, he was being entirely fair, even though he did not punish those who sinned in former times, for he was looking forward to the time when Christ would come and take away those sins. And now, in these days, also he can receive sinners in the same way, because Jesus took away their sin. But isn't this unfair for God to let criminals go free and say that they are innocent? No, for he does it on the basis of their trust in Jesus who took away their sins, the Living Bible Translation says. There are a bit of confusion in people's minds sometimes when they look at a passage like this. God has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He allowed Jesus to take our place, to take away our sins. But remember, this doesn't have happen automatically. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. He gave the opportunity for our sin to be removed and taken care of. But it didn't happen automatically. We had to respond to accept the offer of freedom from our sins by accepting and trusting in Jesus and believing that his death, burial, and resurrection were capable of removing our sins from us from, and being capable of us being changing our relationship from being a sinner to being a saint, to being one who is lost to now one who is found in Christ. But it doesn't happen automatically. Romans chapter 23, 3 verse 23 says, We have all sinned, and we are all worthy of death, Romans 6, 23. 
There are two things to be clarified in this ver these verses. First of all, when it uses the word all have sinned here, Paul is not thinking in terms of babies being sinners. He's thinking in terms of what he's already described in chapter 1, the Gentiles, who knew God but gave up God and made their own gods. And then he moves on to chapter 2 and to 3, where the Jews, who ought to have known better because they had the oracles of God, turned their back on God and did exactly like the Gentiles before them did. So both ended up being sinners by their choice of not willing to follow God and his instructions. And therefore, when it comes to chapter 3, he's describing those he's already described and says, all of these, both Jew and Gentile, who have made the choice to turn their backs on God, he says, all of you have sinned. And verse 4, uh, 6, 23, all are worthy of death. And the other thing to clarify up in, in this verse also is the concept of the word death. Usually when we think of death, we think of physical death. But the word Thanatos often used, uh, it, it's actually used in both senses in the book of Romans. But primarily when Paul's arguing from our freedom from sins and our death that sin brings into our life, he's talking in terms of separation from God. We are separated from God by our sin. We are dead in our sins. But we're still living. We're not talking physically. We're talking spiritually dead. We're spiritually dead unto God. And we need to be made spiritually alive through the blood of Jesus. And so think about both of those implications. Because a baby that's born isn't born a sinner, despite what some people say, from Augustine to Luther and Calvin down through the centuries. Okay? The concept of Adam's sin isn't passed on in that sense to every individual that a child is born a sinner. Paul's not talking about that. He's not talking about all have sinned because all have been born in sin. He's talking in terms of if a baby dies, a baby is already acceptable to God. He doesn't need to have his sins removed because he doesn't have any sin until he comes to an age of an accountability where he makes a choice. And, and knows what the difference is between right and wrong. Uh, and so a baby doesn't have to worry about what Paul says in Romans about all have sinned. Uh, and a person, men a person mentally handicapped doesn't have to worry about all have sinned. Because if you are mentally incapable of understanding right and wrong, then you again are innocent before God. And you don't need to worry about that situation because when if you die, uh, at whatever age you die, you still die innocent and will automatically uh, go in, uh, go to heaven. But he's not talking about that here. He's talking, describing what he's already described in chapter 1 and chapter 2. The Gentiles who consciously turned their back on God to such a degree that God had to walk away from them. Uh, and the Jews who knew the oracles of God but turned their back on the oracles of God and ended up doing much of what the Gentiles did. Uh, he said, all of those in the conclusion, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are worthy of separation from God, punishment from God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's the other side. God certainly is full of grace to offer every person in, his, in, in every nation salvation. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And again, reading carefully this text, he's not saying it happens automatically. Because Jesus died on the cross, because Jesus' blood was shed on the cross to and allow people to have the opportunity of salvation, didn't, doesn't mean that because Jesus died, we are all automatically saved. We need to respond to the grace of God. Without the grace of God, there could be no forgiveness of sins. But God's grace was demonstrated in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that, therefore, through that death, burial, and resurrection, through the, the blood that has been shed, we can have access back to our right relationship with God despite our sin because of what Jesus did. But not automatically. We need to respond to the grace of God. God shows the depth of his love by giving us the opportunity to be saved. Since we have been rebellious and sinful, but God demonstrates his love for us in that even in that sinful state, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That we might, when we come to our senses, have the opportunity of accepting and trusting in Jesus for our salvation. 
Romans 5, 6 and 8 is one of my favourite pa passages. It says, while we are still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Why, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, one will dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died. Have you ever felt in over your head? You find yourself doing things that you don't want to do? You feel pushed by peer pressure to go along with the crowd. You lack the strength to stand against them. When I was young, I was challenged to punch the glass out of a window in Old Mill. And I still have the scars to show it. Weak, helpless, caught up in the crowd, wanting to be accepted. We find ourselves doing things that we know we should not be doing. Yet Paul says that was when God loved us. That is when Christ was prepared to die for us. We need to understand that at that moment, despite our sin, despite ourselves, God loved us anyway. While still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You know people who you would describe as ungodly. You may even have been like that yourself. You're a self-made man or woman. You don't need God. You might even say to God, I, I don't believe in you. I don't want anything to do with you. Keep out of my life. Keep out of my way. Science is my God. Education is my God. We have grown up. We don't need childish beliefs anymore. I don't even believe in Santa Claus anymore. God, you just don't exist. And even if you did, I still don't need you. Yet, it was when we felt like that and acted like that. When we behaved in that manner, that is when God loved us. That is when Christ was prepared to die for us. Why? Because we are his creation. God loved us anyway. God loved us, shows his love for us in that while we are yet sinners. I, I know that sinners is not a popular word today. It's not politically correct. People say, I'm not a liar, I'm just economical with the truth. From the moral high ground, we say, I'm not a murderer. Yet we find ourselves gossiping. Have you heard of Mrs. Jones? We end up destroying her character and tearing her reputation to shreds. Sometimes we sin by doing nothing when we ought to have done something or said something. James 4, 17 says, if you know what you ought to do and fail to do it, that is sin. Yet, that is when God loved us. That is when Christ was prepared to die for us. Despite our sinfulness, despite our hypocrisy, God loved us anyway and allowed his son to pay the price for our sin. Weak, ungodly, sinners. God loves us anyway, and always has done. But our weakness, our arrogance, and our sinfulness places a barrier between us and God. Our sins must be paid for. Sin separates, and God knows we have got ourselves in a hole and cannot get ourselves out. Because of his love for us, he allows Jesus to take our place, to pay the penalty, the price for our sin. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 7, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God, rich in mercy, out of great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses and sins. Most of us do not appreciate what God sees 
when he looks at sin in our lives. We plan sin, we execute the sin, and we think we have got away with it, and it doesn't seem quite so bad. When God looks at our sin, he sees all the damage the sin has done to us. He sees the inside and all the scars it has left. That wrong word, that vicious act, that arrogant attitude, that destructive criticism leaves its mark on our lives and on the lives of others. Do you like hedgehogs? They may be spiky and flea-ridden, but they are cute. We know when we see them the most, they're at the side of the road, when they're all squashed and flattened. When you first drive past, you say, ah, oh, what a shame. But after a few days, it begins to decompose, and the maggots start crawling through it, and it begins to smell. We say, wow, somebody ought to do something about that. It's horrible, and it stinks. We want someone to pick it up and throw it out of our sight. Why? Because it offends us. Yet, that is the effect of sin in our lives. That is what God sees in us when sin leaves its mark on our soul. God's response to our horrible, misshapen mess. He reaches out in love and allows Christ to die in our place. That we might be seen as pure and blameless in his sight. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvellous? God loves us anyway. God loves us that much. Made us alive. Raised us up with him. Made us sit with him. What do you think when you go shopping? You're walking down the main street and you see a scruffy looking individual and even from this distance you can you can smell him. He's shouting abuse at those around him caught up in the madness of his addiction. A wino, a down and out. Some would say a complete waste of space or even scum of the earth. Nothing but trouble. Do you pass on the other side of the street? Do you get as far away as possible? What would you think of someone who instead of passing by took the man home? ran a rose-scented bath for the man, and when he was clean and smelling wonderful, gave him a whole new outfit to wear. Suit, coat, socks, shoes. When he came downstairs, he saw a beautiful dinner. Roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, the big one, not the small one, apple pie and custard. When he'd eaten his fill and was all dressed up, our friend gave him some money, and let him go on his way, clean on the outside, at least. What would you think of someone who could do that? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he amazing? God has done that and more for each one of us who have accepted the sacrifice of his Son. God has fed us spiritually, clothed us in the King's righteousness, and hasn't even sent us away. He has asked us to come and share with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and Christ has gone ahead to prepare a place for each one of us. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous? From filthy rags to spiritual riches, from sinners to saints. Does not show how much God loves us? Does not show that God loves us anyway? First John 3 verse 1 says, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Once we were weak, ungodly sinners, and yet God 
loved us. First John 3, 1 John 3.1 points out that in Christ we have been elevated from those who walk away from God, who want nothing to do with God, to now being those in Christ whom he calls his children. In Christ Jesus, we now have a special, unique relationship with the very creator of the universe. Paul in Romans says we can call him Abba, Father. We can speak to God any time, share with him any problem. Why? Because he loves us and allowed his son to pay the price for our sins. Have you ever stood outside this, the Buckingham Palace and wondered what it would be like to go in and have tea with the Queen? You go up to the soldier by the gate and ask, any chance of getting in? He doesn't even bother to reply, just looks down his nose at you and then ignores you. You turn round dejected because you're dying for a cup of tea. It would be lovely to have tea with the Queen. As you turn round, you bump straight into Prince Charles as he's coming up to the gate. He says, hello, what are you doing here? And you tell him you'd have liked to have gone in for a cup of tea. He puts his arm around your shoulder and says, come on then, come in with me and we'll have some tea. He approaches the soldier at the gate. The soldier does a smart salute and lets you go in without any questions. Why? Because you are with the one who can give you access. You are with the Son. We are able to approach God, the throne of God, because we are children of God, clothed in the righteousness of his Son, because he loves us. And we have given our lives in trust and obedience to him. That shows how much God loves us. That shows God loved us anyway. In 1 John 4 verse 10 to 11 it says, In this is love, not, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Just because you are a child of God and because he loves us anyway, it doesn't mean that we have license to do what we like. Because it does not matter. No. Because we realize that God loves us, we ought to respond with love towards him by accepting the forgiveness and salvation he offers us. Our love ought to make us respond by wanting to be the best that we can be. God sees our potential and wants us to achieve that potential. And therefore, with him on our side and cheering for us, we ought to want to strive to achieve that potential. If we never try, we will never succeed. If we never try, we will never fail. But if we try and fail in some way, it doesn't matter. Because God will be there for us to pick us up and help us try again. Why? Because God loves us anyway. His love will always be there for us. He's already proved that with the cross. God has set the example. He is willing to forgive us, but he recognizes that we need to change. If we want a better world, it begins with us. We cannot change other people. Only God can. And with God's help, we can change our attitudes and the way we talk to and talk about other people. We live in a society that is concerned with self. God challenges us to be selfless. Society cries, what's in it for me? God challenges us to see how we can enable and empower others to reach their goals. God challenges us to share his love with a world that so badly needs it. But we might say, what will it cost me? It may cost you everything. It has already cost God, his only son. How does God save us from our sins? He saved us through Jesus who paid our penalty for sin. Since we're all guilty of sin, we could not take each other's place. Only someone without sin could suffer our punishment. Jesus committed no sin. 
nor was guile found in his mouth. Therefore, he was qualified to take our place. The price God required to save us was the blood of an innocent sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, remission of sin, Hebrew writer says. Although he wasn't guilty of committing any sin, Jesus was nailed to a wooden cross by wicked and sinful men. He suffered great pain for hours. After he died, a soldier pierced his side with a spear. Blood and water came out, John 19.34. His blood was offered for our sins, the Hebrews 9 verse 12. With this blood, Jesus washes away our sin, washes our sins away, Revelation 1 verse 5. Nothing else can make us clean or remove our sins but the blood of Jesus. If our sins are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, they will continue to separate us from God and all his goodness forever. The need for the cross. It shows God to be just and that he did what his own law demanded. He was also the one who justifies and pardons all those who have faith in Jesus. God has never been short of sacrifices. Rivers of blood flowed from Israel's altars, yet they were unable to pay the price for sin and satisfy God's justice. Martyrs, too numerous to mention, gave their lives sacrificially in the service of the Lord. Yet, not even their deaths could pay the price of sin. Father Maximilian Kolb, a Polish Franciscan priest, caught the attention of the world's press when his noble deed became known. He was a prisoner in Auschwitz concentration camp. When Kolb heard that a married man with a family had been selected for execution, he volunteered to take this man's place. Kolb became a substitute so that another man might live. Jesus became our substitute when he took our sins upon himself. He himself bore our sin in his body on the tree. The debt incurred by our sins could only be paid by an adequate sacrifice offered on our behalf. Though two other men died along with Jesus on that day, yet only his death was able to cancel our sin. Peter captures the concept of Christ being our substitute and saviour in these words. He says, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. In a crucified Christ, we see the following. We see the love of God, the wisdom of God, the justice of God, and a perfect sacrifice in Jesus, who has made forgiveness possible. Hebrews 2 9 says should taste of death, a metaphor to express to die as a sacrifice, making satisf satisfaction to divine justice and expiating sins. It's a metaphor allusive to the Grecian custom, who put men to death by giving them a cup of poison as the Athenians executed Socrates. All his sufferings in body and soul, which are many and bitter, are here intended and their completion by death. The dilemma of mankind, sin. The wages of sin is spiritual separation from God. All men have sinned. Therefore all men stand under the penalty of death, that is, without hope. I'm a sinner, big or little. I do not meet the standard I was made to meet. I've gone wrong. Because of sin, I'm cut off from a proper relationship with God, my maker. Salvation is all about getting back into a proper relationship of love and righteousness with God. There's nothing I can do myself to make myself right with God. God is a God of righteousness, justice and holiness. He is perfect and cannot simply overlook my sin. The need of, salvation, of mankind is salvation. Salvation means a deliverance from great danger. It means preservation, saved from destruction. Man is saved from spiritual death, saved from condemnation, saved from eternal punishment. But can a man be saved from something that doesn't exist? If it did not exist, 
then it presents no danger. Therefore, salvation is not needed. The errors of mankind often have two extremes. We either think of all of works, man working to save himself. Or we think it's all of grace. Man can do nothing. God has done everything for us. Salvation will depend on God's choice. Justification by work, some modern attempts. I will be saved if I live a good life, if I do good and try my best. I will be saved if I go to church, pray, read my Bible, give to charity. I will be saved if I am sincere in what I believe. I will be saved if I go to the right church and believe the right things. I will be saved because I do not kill or rob, I try to be honest and live right. I'm afraid of going to hell, so I go to church to get me to heaven. I go to church because it's my duty. If I don't do this, I will not be saved. I go to the same church my mum went to. If it was good enough for her, I'll be okay. Justification by faith alone. Some people say, you can do nothing. Simply believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Is there a contradiction in that statement? You can do nothing. And then you're asked to simply believe. Well, surely, if you're asked to simply believe, you're doing something. You're asked to believe. Some people say, pray. Pray that the Lord Jesus will come into your heart tonight. What does the Bible say? Salvation is impossible to attain by relying on our own good works. Salvation is not by faith alone. So you see, it isn't enough just to have faith. Faith that doesn't show itself by good deeds is no faith at all. It's dead and useless, James 2.17 says. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. I say, I can't see your faith if you don't have good deeds. But I will show you my faith through my good deeds, James continues. What we do. What we do cannot save us, not by our deeds. Forgiveness is not based upon our good deeds, no matter how many or how honourable they are. Forgiveness is a free, unmerited gift from God, and we accept it by faith. Yet many try to earn their way to heaven. They think that God will inspect their lives based on how well they did well on earth. God will either then decide to lead them to heaven or to banish them for eternity. An inescapable conclusion comes from this line of thinking. If we are contributors to our own salvation, if our works can save us, then the death of Jesus was not only inadequate, but unnecessary. The Apostle Paul put it this way. If righteousness could be gained through the law, <coughs> Christ died for nothing. Jesus came to set us free, to give us new life, not to supply us with a new set of rules and regulations to be obeyed in order to get to heaven. The last thing we need is a religion based upon our performance. What we need is someone to give a perfect performance for us. And we find that performance accept, accomplished in Jesus Christ. The word of God speaks clearly on this subject. It is by grace that you have been saved. And this is not from ourselves. It is grace. It's a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The religion of the Pharisee. Jesus pointed out the folly of trying to earn one's way to heaven when he told the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. The lesson was directed to some who were confident of their own righteousness. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee began his prayer by parading all his good deeds before God. Pride filled his heart as he thanked God he was not like those around him, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even this tax collectors who are notorious for their dishonesty. The Pharisee continued his prayer as a reminder to God. He fasted twice each week. He gave 10% of his income to the Lord. The publican also prayed, but in a different tone. He stood at a distance and couldn't even raise his eyes to heaven, but in true repentance said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Which of these two people were forgiven? It was the publican, Jesus said, not the Pharisee, that found favour with God. 
Why didn't the Pharisee find favor with God? After all, he believed in God. He said his prayers. He lived a good life. Where did he go wrong? The problem with the Pharisee was he was trusting in the performance of his religious duties to save him. The Pharisee didn't believe he was sinless, but felt that his good deeds, which were many, would tip the scales of God's justice in his favour. He thought the good deeds of his life would more than compensate for his failings, and he would surely get a very favourable verdict. But he was wrong. The religious treadmill the religious practice of the Pharisee reminds us of two children playing on an escalator. They were trying to go up the stairs and were coming down. No matter how hard they tried, they failed. The stairs kept bringing them back to where they started. Finally, they got off and went over to the stairs and were moving upwards, stepping on and letting the stairs take them to the top. How much more love could Jesus show than to be punished for our sins and then he'd allow his blood to wash them all away? The question remains, how do we get our sins removed and receive eternal life? Grace and faith at Pentecost. Someone asked a question at Pentecost when asked, what must we do? Can you explain why Peter didn't reply? Why, there's nothing you can do. It's already all been done. Just accept what you've been told, what have been told you. Rely totally on the grace of God alone. These are not inquisitive students on Pentecost, striving to understand the theories and the mysteries of salvation. They're desperate souls, deeply convinced of their sin against Jesus himself, whom they just learned is Israel's resurrected Messiah and now ascended Lord. They are ready and willing to do whatever Jesus commands. And Peter instructs them according to the Lord's own parting commission. The apostle commands their conscious stricken audience to make a spiritual U-turn on the inside, repentance, to turn away from their past and to turn back to God, and to express that repentance individually in a tangible, physical way on the outside, to be baptised. Man's part of salvation, although salvation comes by the grace of God and is available to all, and without the grace of God demonstrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we couldn't have salvation. There is a response man must make. Otherwise, all men would be saved no matter what they did, no matter what their attitudes were. They would be saved automatically, but were not saved automatically. Jesus died for everyone's sins, for all the sins of every individual in the whole world. But not all people will be saved, because many will not accept the terms of God's gift. In order to receive salvation, we must respond in the way that God requires. Responding the way God requires doesn't mean we earn salvation in any way by our response. We must believe and know that God exists, because without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. We must also believe that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, God stepping into humanity who came to save us from our sins and pay the price for our sins. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will die in your sins. Salvation is by the grace of God. Grace is goodwill or benevolence which is totally undeserved, unmerited favour, mercy. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works. Therefore, salvation is on God's terms, not on our terms. God offers me salvation as a free, undeserved gift. He offers his gift not because I am worthy, but because he loves me. I need to accept this gift for it to be mine. God does not force it on me. I accept it by trust, faith, which leads to obedience, doing what God says I need to do, in order to respond to the gift of grace. The result, the Christian life is lived as a love response to God's great gift. Our continued obedience and good works are done not in order to save us, but because we are already saved, not out of duty or fear, but out of thankfulness and love. Not because we have to, but because we want to. 
the way of salvation is demonstrated in God's grace and our acceptance, our trust through faith, our repentance, our confession and baptism is our faith response to God's grace. Baptism response to the gospel is a specific act of submission and surrender to the crucified and risen Messiah into the name of, into a relationship with Jesus the Christ. Because Pentecost marks the beginning of the last days, God will fulfill his ancient promise to save and to give his spirit, his personal powerful presence to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. All those whom God calls to himself, calls through the gospel. These truths are limited to Pentecost audience or even to Jewish people, but are applicable to men and women from all nations throughout the gospel era. It is right to remember that baptism doesn't cause God to love us. Baptism doesn't make us merit salvation or earn God's forgiveness. It's not a work that we do that sets us right with God. That work was fully accomplished by Jesus of Nazareth before we ever heard of it. Jesus paid the price. Only because Jesus finished that saving work which both demonstrated and justified God's love for sinners can anyone repent to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins using Peter's very words of instruction to his Pentecost audience. There's no conflict between grace on one hand and faith, repentance and baptism on the other. As long as those who respond in faith, repentance and baptism do so, trusting God's grace as shown in Jesus Christ. Though faith is not identical with knowledge, it is no means devoid of knowledge. Faith doesn't operate in a vacuum. To be saved, one must believe some basic information. Proclaiming the gospel includes more than imparting information, but by no means less. There is a basic content of the gospel which includes information about God, man, the passion and work of Christ, and how his benefits are appropriated, which we must have some awareness of in order to exercise saving faith. There is an aspect of faith which refers to intellectual assent truth of the data of con or content of the gospel. To believe that Maggie Thatcher was a Prime Minister of England means that we affirm the truth of that proposition. We cannot have saving faith if we do not believe the gospel is true. I cannot decide to believe something if my mind is not convinced that it is not true, that it is true. I can hope that something questionable is true and act according to that hope. What I cannot do is actually be convinced of a truth by a mere decision. Faith without genuine assent is no more than credulity or superstition. Saving faith involves personal trust. This is usually understood as involving something in addition to the cognitive or purely intellectual element. It involves the volition and effective elements of human response. It involves our repentance, a change in us, which change includes a change in affection, disposition, inclination and volition. We now choose Christ. We embrace Christ. We want to follow Christ. We flee to Christ. Real faith in Jesus and without faith is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, and I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Faith responds in obedience. Faith is essential if we bear right with God. But what does faith mean? Faith means to trust, to believe. And in Abraham, we have a model for that type of faith. His life was punctuated with demonstrations of faith, trust, belief in God. He was told by God to leave his home and go to a foreign land. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place where he would later receive his, as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Hebrews, Hebrews 11 verse 8 says, That is a demonstration of faith. Faith believes the impossible. 
God promised Abraham a son. Time passed and the promise remained unfulfilled. Abraham was now 99 years old and his wife Sarah was 90. God spoke again to him about the promise of a son. Though surrounded by physical impossibilities, Abraham had a faith that what God said would indeed come to pass. And when his son Isaac was born and was grown, Abraham was commanded to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. God never allowed Abraham to take the young man's life, although Abraham showed he was prepared to do so. And for this reason, Abraham is called God's friend. That is faith. The type of faith Abraham displayed is the kind of faith that we are to have. A faith that believes in God. A faith that trusts in God. A faith that obeys God. I hope you'll take time to come back and look at the second part of the way of salvation next time. May God bless you in all that you do.